Uh, good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Eric Schoenfrey, and together with Marissa Yu, we're teaching Inter 1 in um, the Intermediate School. And it's a pleasure to introduce Paul Kaiser this evening, and together with uh, Shelley Eshkar and also Mark Downey are the principals of Open Ended Group. And the work I find to be, I have to say, um, visually complex, but also it has a sense of being at times a, a, a little bit sparse. But one of my favorite pieces, for instance, is Trace, and it's composed of a bit of um, very elegant prose and just a few drops of rain, um, computer-generated rain. And in the work, there's always a sense of evolution. And they've worked with some of the most um, famous choreographers of our time, um, Merce Cunningham, Bill T. Jones, and Trisha Brown as well as new works that are uh, computer-generated um, artificial intelligent agents. And so the work is always alive, always fresh, and it's never the same twice. Um, the installations have been at notable institutions around the world, uh, including the summer at Lincoln Center, and also now in New York, um, which is what brings Paul to England this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure in welcoming Paul Kaiser. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, I was here in 2001 uh, before, so I know your school a little bit from then. And um, it's always a pleasure to see Eric, whom I don't know very well, but whose work I love. And um, Eric has already mentioned that um, I have two collaborators. The work that I do is, as you'll see in a moment, involves a sense of phantom presence. So tonight you can imagine the phantom presence of Shelley Ashgar here and Mark Downey there or vice versa in this spectral way. And uh, anything intelligent I say probably is being uh, telepathically transmitted to me from them. Um, the name of the talk is uh, a new kind of picture. But rather than uh, try to define it um, at the outset, I thought we could develop the idea through examples. And then at the very end, I'll try to define it formally for what that's worth. What I'd like to do is to, uh, is to always talk in specific terms by looking at examples of some of the previous work that we've done which, as Eric points out, has been in, the, in dance and in installation, and then currently almost exclusively in public art installations. The shape of the talk is going to be an odd one because I'm going to rush through the first bit, covering old ground, and then I'm going to dwell and linger on this incredible discovery of last week, the piece we're currently making, it seemed to be a kind of a threshold of crossing. And then I'll kind of sprint to the finish line after that. So I'm, I'm going to refer back first to uh, some of the early work. Um, one of the guiding principles in, in works like uh, this one, uh, Ghost Catching, was the notion that you could, that I wanted to subvert and reinvent uh, what, at the time, this is in the late 90s, was the incredible um, fixation on photorealism in 3D animation, uh, which the more realistic it looked, the, the less natural it felt. So this is an example of a piece that we made, Shelly Eshkar and I, with Bill T. Jones as the subject, and the movements derive from motion capture. So we record the movement of the dancer, we set it on a body, but we make the body look more like a hand drawing, a gesture drawing, than like a computer model. And there's an interesting interplay between media because you have a sense of the figure being drawn on the one hand, but also the figure inscribing, ins doing the drawing itself through its motions, as you can see here. So the figure is both made up of a drawing in 3D as well as um, its trajectories through space, drawn and being drawn by movement. Yeah. 
in a work like this for the stage, also the same year, 99, um, was with, with uh, Merce Cunningham's group. We projected on a large scrim similar kinds of figures, although very often more abstracted like these. And this is our setup. We had a, a large scrim in front with the projections on them, and then the dancers in, the, in, the, in between, and then these strips of white in the back that, that captured or reflected back shards of the image in the front, the spillover, basically. And what that allowed us to do was to play with perceptual illusion, because although what we were doing was obviously a, a flat projection, the figures m seemed to mingle perceptually in the space of the dancers. So that naive members of the audience asked us how we did those holograms, and so on and so forth. It's interesting also to try to um, break down certain barriers between the virtual and the physical in pieces like that. Um, after we had made that kind of uh, anti-photorealistic piece, we, Shelley and I made a piece called Pedestrian that embraced photorealism. Um, we projected it directly onto streets, uh, starting in New York in four different locations. This being Rockefeller Center here, we project directly down it. And the compositions that we were making were very photographic. They were really about photography in some ways, Rodchenko and so on. And what was interesting about this, though, is not the, that the images work by themselves, but it was their combination with the physical uh, projection surface that they met. So here's an example of a shot on the street where the image merges with the um, pavement itself. And so the texture maps that you have in this image are confused with the real texture of the concrete, and so on and so forth. We were also playing with, on the one hand, with photography, but also with the idea of computers themselves. So the the um, the paving here, for example, is exaggeratedly large, so it looks more like a game board, perhaps, like so. And. Um, in the piece, the bystanders become elements of the piece. And Shelley puts it that, that the, the person looking it over it is the skyscraper. We don't represent any skyscrapers in the piece. The people are the skyscraper. And the um, nature of the spectacle, really, is that you watch the people watching the piece as much as you watch the piece itself. And their choreography is part of the choreography of their overall, overall piece. So, um, that was my rush through early work. <laughs> I've skipped over a number of pieces to, to get to there. And instead I thought I wanted to talk briefly about a uh, more explicitly architectural thing that we were going to do, which is now suspended in uh, the um, strange politics of Atlanta, city of Atlanta. But we were commissioned to do a very large piece for a new terminal um, the International Terminal in Atlanta, and it was going to be very large, uh, 280 feet wide by 28 feet tall, which we would have um, illuminated by LEDs embedded in the structure, which, oops, that's the structure, it looks like I'm zoomed in now. Our visual conception for the piece, which you'll see uh, continues to play an important role for us, is that we would play a kind of game whereby we would shrink the proportions of this mammoth uh, airport. Well, I landed in Heathrow today where they said it was the world's busiest airport. If you land in Atlanta, they'll say that's the world's busiest airport. Um, it's, a, it's a bustling place in any case. And our notion was to shrink the huge, magnify the small, and make the airport into a kind of dollhouse. Uh, that was played with by the virtual children that we were creating. So these are just storyboard views. And you'd have uh, the virtual children playing with elements, 
of the airport in real time and responding to conditions in the airport. So if a plane is landing, you know, they might put out their finger to become the jet bridge and transport these, these uh, things like almost like ladybugs, moving it from one finger to another. And it was going to be, or maybe still will be, uh, continuously varying 24 hours a day for 10 years. This is the, uh, the view of it. We fortunately got rid of the architectural vanity, the, that buttress thing. Uh, straight, the window you see at the far, uh, in the vanishing point, is a window on downtown Atlanta, and our, our piece is perpendicular to that. You can see it when you arrive, clear customs. You can see it uh, from the luggage carousel below, and then you can see it from the main departures hall. And the notion behind this very ambitious one was to do all of this in real time, have all the figures controlled with, by their own desires through artificial intelligence, which is something I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, the piece has been, although we, we won the commission, it was suspended when they when the thing went millions and millions and millions of dollars over budget, the building itself, and they fired the architects and the engineers who countersued. So that's where that is right now. <coughs> okay. So now I, now I want to talk about in, in much greater detail what we're currently doing and what I'll be showing in New York in this festival up there shortly. So this is a piece called Playground. Reminds me a little bit of Bedford Square, which I had so much trouble finding today. Because with um, an image like this that you create, you're putting a circle into a square, just like Bedford Square. And although you may be wasting uh, pixels on the one hand and greenery on the other, you get this very pleasing, interesting shape of the circle. What we did this past, well, this has been a long time in the making. In fact, I thought of Playground more than 10 years ago as an idea, although it has a mind of its own, it's gone its own direction. But the idea behind it was when we do, when we work with human motion, we never preconceive sequences, but instead we make a very large assemblage of libraries of motion, essentially. So this, for example, is a, um, a list of all the motions we captured for this piece so far. This is, for those of you who've done motion capture, I can brag by saying we did all this in one day because it's so expensive. Um, so for example, just to give you, see what that looks like. These are all the, if, if you have kids hiding from each other, these are all the hider actions and also the communications between hiders and seekers and so on and so forth. And this is a, um, a visualization of that library. Just, as you can see, very short clips of motion uh, which can be slowed down, uh, changed direction, and then blended to create enormous variation of movement. In the old days when we were working uh, on biped and ghost catching, we used a similar process, except that it was all done by hand. And now what we do is uh, let the computer do that kind of work for us. So what I would like to do now is I'm going to show you a clip of maybe a minute of playground as it, it currently works. And I'll explain it's what it represents. And I'll go very in great detail as to how, how it works uh, aesthetically and technically. That what you'll see in a moment is a real-time rendering of a 3D scene where everything is computed in real time. The camera movement and so on is completely flexible. Although we're playing it back, uh, obviously, on, as a quick time fixed piece. Uh, as we're making it, it's completely real um, and, and changeable. Uh, not only its camera position, but the way it's lit or the motions we put into it and so on are completely live. Um, so that was a key thing. And th this render, which is uh, programmed by Mark Downey and which came together only this past week, is at least for me a kind of um, astonishing breakthrough. So let's see if it is for you.
So what's interesting about that kind of scene that I'd like to explain is that it it builds upon two systems that are loosely aligned. One, of course, is the human perceptual system of how you perceive visual events in in the natural world. And the other one is how you, on the computer, how you make a photorealistic scene. And it takes both those systems and, and by subverting the one, subverts the other. Or not subverts the other, but enhances the other. So here's an example of how this image is put together, and I want to go through this in some detail, even if only for Eric's benefit. So this, for example, is at the easiest level uh, light and material interaction if you have a bunch of um, triangles, which are the leaves, and you have a variable source of light moving through it, you get the projection of light. <coughs> you can also project, obviously, the shadows of that light. And if you combine those two things, you have all the elements of a first-person shooter game. If you were to add texture maps to this in a conventional way, it, it runs in real time, and you could navigate it through in real time. You'd have an advanced version of Doom or something like that in that way. But um, obviously, that's not what we're after, um, although we build on those techniques to that point. One trick that we use, however, is we're always looking at the depth of the image, not so much from just its sort of perspective but how things are moving in depth. And very often things are moving only as a consequence of camera action, as you'll see. And that becomes a key element to this kind of rendering system that we have. So I want to show just some examples. There, there are three different scenes so far in this piece, which I've now rethought to some degree, but there are three right now. And you'll see examples of them. There are, most of them come from this forest scene. There's also one of a jungle gym and another one of a frozen landscape. So one thing that you'll see in the piece is movement-directed grain, as we call it, where the actual grain of the image is responsive to the camera movement in an interesting way. So I'll give you an example of that. This one is from the uh, jungle gym scene. So the renderer takes its knowledge of the movement of the scene to distort or move the underlying grain of the image in that instance. The other thing the renderer does a lot is it looks at um, what you'd say in film would be pull focus, where you have multiple focus renderings. So in this case, you have a hider and a seeker, and the hider is in clear view, and the, and the seeker is, is not. I'll show you an example of that in motion. There's a single figure, again, in the jungle gen scene, where you'll see that uh, his body parts become clear, like his foot suddenly stands out, and then not as we push the focus through the various planes of the image. Another thing we use is an exaggeratedly high s sort of sensitivity to light. And in fact, the incredible richness of the playground image of lighting and a sense of weather and so on and so forth is entirely a kind of emergent property. None of it's, you know, none of it was modeled in or, or um, carefully structured in that way. So here's an example of that. You get from a different scene some truly bizarre shapes that don't play very well on my laptop, but this is from the ice storm scene, where the heightened lighting gives it this amazing abstraction, which you, and you'll see what it, as we come out, what it's from. is essentially the lighting around 
the branches of a tree and the horizon line and a rock. Yeah. Um, there's also a responsiveness in the image of line to movement and depth. So lines aren't simply, you know, fixed. We don't just model a line and let that line, you know, change just by its position in relation to the camera, but rather it responds to that in a fairly rich way. So let me show you that. I think I have two examples of that. So here you can see as the figure, as the uh, camera passes over the jungle gym, the lines of the jungle gym keep changing as in fact do that does the uh, crosshatch patterns. The other thing we, that we use is that there's, um, <laughs> the scene is very, very simply composed. If you see it in its 3D model, it's a, much simpler than, than most scenes, very sparse. But <clears throat> we use some of the artifacts of that uh, and heighten them in the image. In this case, to give kind of uh, odd sense of depth cue from the tessellation of the ground plane. It's this very simple geometry of the, of the mesh of the, of the ground. It gives a kind of striated image that you read as depth. Let me show that to you. See the, all those slight diagonal lines? Or that, and you'll see, I think in a moment, a more pronounced seam. Yeah, there are several. Okay, the other important idea is that each, although, again, we didn't model this in, in fact, there are no texture maps in the piece, uh, the sort of the microstructure of individual objects is revealed through cross-hatching. It's done procedurally. So I'll show you that. So if you just concentrate on any one, one object, like the figure or a tree or something, you'll, you'll see how the hatching of that changes dynamically. It's almost as if there are times when, a, when, although a tree, the structure of a tree remains distant, its texture is suddenly very close to you. And you can almost see its, its microstructure, even though it's, it hasn't changed in its distance from the camera. But yeah, this, is, this is quite important. The idea is that, that even if you can't see an occlusion of an object, you can feel its persistence in the image. It's almost a, a little bit like a painted mask over it that the motion trail creates over the underlying geometry. It's a startling effect. I mean, actually, this example shows many different things, um, especially with the twirl of the, of the figure, the, the change in the grain. One of the interesting things about uh, this kind of work 
is oops, is um, that on the one hand, lots of properties emerge from it. Um, oops, no, I think I showed the wrong example. This is actually more of the uh, occlusion idea. You'll see an interesting figure with a tree in a moment. Yeah, I think watch the effect, if I remember this right, watch the effect of the tree on the left with the other figures. There's a kind of dynamic painting of the, of one, of whatever surface is in front, including the other, onto the one in the back, as if it's spilling over. And what's interesting about doing this kind of rendering is you have a feeling of almost the physical properties um, of, oops, the physical properties of the piece, as if the renderer had its own physical, oops, physical properties in the same way that, oh, I, that was a mistake, in the same way that, let's say, paint does. I have to advance through this. For the piece in New York, which is really just a prototype or preview of the piece, because it doesn't yet have real, uh, real-time artificial intelligence or interactivity, we made <coughs> we're making uh, dual projections in the storefront window, somewhere in the streets of New York, and <coughs> we have uh, two views on the same scene at all times to get this kind of doubled image, always of the same, same thing. Uh, my I don't, my computer isn't powerful enough to play this back for you. I'm sorry to say. I tried to make a version that you could see, but it, when it when it was small enough to actually run, it was too small to make out. So, um, so we have this, these pairs of 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 images, and we imagine for the ultimate version of Playground, which is commissioned by a group called Dancing the Streets in New York City for 2008, that there would be many many different. Um, images, views on the same image in circles. And all of them would be both interactive, they would know, sense your presence and react to it, as well as um, autonomous, they would make up their own minds. So what I've just been showing you is a, a real-time renderer, but what I haven't yet shown you is how the children, the virtual children in that world can be endowed with intentions of their own, and the world itself can be given attention spans and tendencies and so on and so forth. So to prove that part of it, I want to go back to and rush through a very complex work that we made this past summer for Lincoln Center called Enlightenment, modest name. Oops. Um, so it was, a, it was a commission from the Mostly Mozart Festival celebrating his 300th birth. Oops. And <coughs> what we came up with was a, a real-time interactive, not interactive, real-time autonomous artificial intelligence 10-screen piece at unbelievably high resolution. Um, just to give you a sense of this, because that is an important part of the new kind of image, is that the new kind of image can be extremely <laughs> high resolution. We were animating uh, 41 mi million pixels in real time and making, over the course of four weeks, 135 million frames of animation, which became 18 petabytes of data. One unfortunate consequence, although it was consonant with the idea of its being at a center for performing arts, which are notoriously hard to preserve, is I can't show you any of it, any of it except stills. There's this, extra <laughs> this extraordinary problem that we have, which is that when you render things at the highest uh, speed and, and um, resolution, you can blast them to the screen much faster than you can save them. So we, to save it as a QuickTime proved impossible. 
absolutely insane. Anyway, that's a small detail. Oops, I shouldn't be there. I keep messing up here. Oops, that's also wrong. There we go. So we, we put it in Avery Fisher Hall. I don't know if you, those of you know New York. Lincoln Center is, I guess, the equivalent of the Barbican, maybe. And uh, similarly ugly in its architecture. And uh, Avery Fisher Hall is the one. All right here. And who's this right there? The idea is we had 10 high resolution screens uh, that were running 24 hours a day live. The puzzle of the piece, which is a very peculiar one, was to see if we could take the coda of Mozart's Last Symphony, basically you know, 30 seconds of, of extraordinary complexity of, of uh, uh, fugal composition with these amazing themes interwoven in this virtuosic way. Perhaps the most complex passage in Western music, they say. I'm not a musicologist. And to see whether we could have our computers, our artificial intelligence, not deconstruct it, which is so 20th century, but reconstruct it, which is more interesting, I think, now. Um, and in fact, the tools that we use to do that are very similar to ones all, that happen all around in the world for us. I mean, uh, Mark incorporated algorithms from things like um, DNA sequencing. Or a similar thing happens even in an AdWords uh, search in Google where it goes to this amazing number of steps to render out for you in, in the next second the text ad that you want, that it thinks you need to launch. Um, and this is, uh, that's impressive, right? So the first thing that we did is we, by we, I'm really saying Mark, not me, because I know nothing about it. We had the computer look at the score and pick out its, see if it could pick out on its own the themes, which it did completely successfully, you'll see that's exactly what it was. That's untouched by human hands. Just search codes found those easily. And then it could do something a little bit more than what a musicologist normally does. It could then trace out over the whole fourth movement what were the corresponding points. Where, where is that material first seen in the whole piece? And starts drawing these connections between them of frequency and correspondence. Um, then another thing, and I'm skipping over this very rapidly. The other thing we did was rather than just looking at the score, we looked at its performance by 10 musicians. So we motion tracked, uh, in this case, the, who is that? the second violinist. And um, we compared the musician's interpretation of the score with the abstract score itself that Mozart wrote. Because the essence, of course, of music is the fine human interpretation by the, by the musician of the perfection of the score. And it's that interaction where the timing is just microseconds different that gives it its, its nuance. So we looked at that, and this is a diagram of how that, how that works. In this case, you'll see in the lower, lower bit, um, the, the arcs are basically the bowings of that particular musician as she interprets the score. And there are differences in timing. Um, the piece itself ran for about 25, second, 25 minutes per cycle. In the first phase, called weaving, it would sort of gather up the notes in Mozart's vocabulary and thus essentially establish the tuning of the piece. It's called weaving in this instance. Um, this is a blow up on it, as you can see, even in this not particularly great projection, the, uh, the lines are extremely fine. One of the most important ideas in this piece for us was that you could, unlike most uh, electronic displays, you could see it from a distance, at least at night, very clearly, but it rewarded you. If you walked up to it very, very, very close, this far away, you would see more in it. It would disclose more. In that respect, it was more like a material object, like, like paint, a painting, for example, than the usual digital display or electronic display where you walk up towards an LED display or towards a television screen. It just breaks apart into meaninglessness. Uh, as I say, there were, there were four parts to it. In this part, the AIs would find the themes. So each screen was a particular instrument. So let's say you had the second violinist finding its 
the themes it needed for the piece. And you could hear them gradually, by trial and error, honing in on the exact right themes, which it would take them about 10 minutes to do. And then after that, oh, here's a close-up of that. And then after that, the, it was, you had to solve the counterpoint. How did you position all those themes in relationship to each other? So how does the, when does the viol first violinist play you know, theme two, and when does the bass player come in with theme, theme four, and so on and so forth? And so what they did was they, for the first time, the computer started listening to each other, all 10 of them to each other, and they would, by trial and error, they would put the whole puzzle together, almost like a Rubik's Cube, and that also took about 10 minutes. And at the very end, uh, they'd perform it. You would see, oh, here's more stills of, the, of that s solution. But at the very end, you'd see it performed by, um, by various, by the various instruments abstracted. This came from a two camera shoot, not motion capture, we just tracked in video uh, the, the lines and points. And they performed it that way. 25 seconds, and then they'd throw away everything they'd learned and start, start from scratch again. And I'd come up with a slightly different path towards the solution of this, this piece. Um, now we're, we have another piece of all things in New York in, in, uh, in this January. Maybe some of you can come see it if, if you like. And it's a projection on the minster there where the east w side of it is under scaffolding at present. So they commissioned us to make a large uh, projection, which is what we're working on right now, which will incorporate uh, the real-time renderer, but it will also have interactivity and um, artificial intelligence, autonomy of the agents, uh, which I can describe briefly right now. Uh, the idea that we had artistically is that this is covering over the scaffolding, this preservation of scaffolding is covering over one of the significant uh, stained glass pieces in England, or Northern Europe even, the eastern window. So we thought of our projection as being, in a sense, a kind of x-ray into that world. We have uh, figures drawing the, the outlines of the different panels and then, and then assembling them. We also have uh, these elements here are actual lights. So we have at least two lights that uh, connect the rectangular projection with the rest of the facade. And they're also under interactive control. We have enough motions in the, in the library that we can make a drawing machine, essentially, and, and from the motions fashion any outline we wish. In other words, if you have enough motion captures of a child drawing a straight curve and curved lines, you could then program and alter that so that, the, that you can tell it to draw anything at all. And so we have that ability in this piece, although we're, well, it's another story. We may back away from using that so much. Oh, this is the inside. That's the window. And here's a typical panel that we would use. Uh, and that's just a diagram of how it would be, how it would be done. We have two, ca two overlapping cameras. With those, we can track the position in 3D space of any motion of, of uh, audience members. And their motions will control our, the virtual camera view of, of that space behind the scaffold. So that's basically how it works. And <laughs> the projection people that we're working with have a really great idea. We couldn't figure out where to put the projector in the winter that would be safe and warm and stuff. So the projection company has a van, and they'll drive it out, run it, and then drive it off to their next daytime gig and then come back at night to do it again. And that'll be up for three weeks. It's something called uh, the Renaissance Festival. Um, yeah, that's that. Oh, this is, I should have shown this earlier. This is just a very simple thing that Shelley put together just yesterday for this talk, which is an example of how playground might be put in the subways. We're going to be looking in New York. We're looking at all kinds of ways for the piece to be um, put in public. 
for 2008 there. And one, the idea is we're going to be making these essentially, essentially um, circular units. And what's great about it is they can be configured any, in any way you want, depending on the site. Um, they can then be rearranged through the artificial intelligence and, and rendering system in response to that particular thing. You can make a gigantic wall like this, or much larger, in fact, or you could embed them in the, um, in the pavement surface, which is something that interests us a lot, although it's much more difficult to get permission to do. And now for the um, promised definition of what we're heading towards in this new kind of picture. Uh, one is the idea that it's, so, it's, it's such high resolution that it has the same rewards looking at it as you do looking at a physical object, where uh, distance actually enhances rather than limits your, your view of it. Um, secondly, all the, all the images are essentially diagrams of understanding of the piece. <coughs> they are the AI's best guess at some way of figuring something out. That notion of best guess also has to do with the idea that we have of trying for you to feel the effort and intention of the computer. That was very important in enlightenment, that it not just be solved like this, the way we normally think of computers doing it, but you see it uh, gradually s solving the problem and going down wrong paths and, and figuring it out properly. Um, in order to get that kind of effort and intention, you need for the work to be in some disequilibrium with the environment. So if you have a deep or rich interaction with the environment, the environment keeps changing the work. And it's not because of a kind of direct interaction that one thing happens in the real world and it's mirrored and mimicked in the um, artwork, but it's rather the artwork has to somehow try to understand what happened or take it into account or incorporate it. And it forces it to essentially think of new things. Uh, goes without saying that the idea of that is it has to be live to do that. We have often shied away from doing directly interactive pieces in favor of autonomous pieces. It's all a different kind of liveness, although our new work will all be interactive. Uh, but, but for example, Enlightenment was not, it interacted with it, with it within itself, so to speak, but not with the viewer. And then the last thing, I didn't, I, I didn't come up with a good phrase for it, but the idea is that you can come up with a complex piece who's, that, that keeps surprising you as you work with it. You aren't dictating to it exactly what each frame will look like. But nor are you just throwing everything up to chance or to processes so complex you can't understand them. You always have a sense in making this kind of work of it uh, that, that the complexity is tunable, that you can direct it in certain directions, push it in di different directions. The most astonishing thing when Shelley and I started working with Mark using uh, AI was the notion that it was such a, a two-way street between the artwork almost um, pushing back against us and then we push against it. And it's this odd but tunable interaction between the two systems that are interesting. And, and at its best, what happens in, in a work like this is that even if you make the work, you keep being surprised by its results as it goes out into the world. So that's what I came here to talk about. I'd be happy to answer any questions or hear any comments. So maybe if you could bring up the lights a bit. Yeah, well, it's it's um, all custom built, although it builds on open source for s lot large numbers of things. But the actual uh, visual code and the AI is custom. We do have plans to release it as open source. In fact, we were supposed to do it this month, but we haven't done it yet. There's an authoring system that Mark has made called Fluid, with which we made um, both Enlightenment and a work I didn't talk about, uh, the Trisha Brown piece. Uh, which is also a very complex, interactive AI piece. Um, and we're planning to release Fluid 
for other people to use. So look at our website, openendedgroup.com. But it, we do, I mean, we obviously use a lot of open source material as well that's incorporated in these pieces, and that gets credit too. Anything else? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, we had Macintosh quad machines, G5 machines. Uh, that's what we're currently, um, all of our work right now is on the Mac. It used to be on PC, but we switched over recently. Although I've been slow in following, unfortunately. I think it was 2800 by 1800 or something like that. I can't remember. High resolution. 30 inch monitor. Sim similar to the 30 inch. Yes. Why didn't you just put out a proxy Because you can't. That's the problem. You can't do it. You, it's, it you're arresting so much performance from the computer that you can't make a copy at the same moment. And in fact, Printing to disk is slower than printing to the screen, so to speak. So I'm told, beyond my expertise. But it, believe me, it's a major problem for us. We don't really have a good I mean, We're going to go back and try to make a version of Enlightenment that records itself, but it's harder, than, it's harder to record it than to actually make it perform. Uh, same, you know, so. But it's sending the frame to the screen. It's sending the frame to the graphics card. It's not, it's not the same thing as sending the frame to the hard, dri hard drive. Graphics cards are much faster than the computer innards. And Mark rests every bit of performance from whatever uh, graphics card we're using. It's Again, I'm not really the right person to answer your questions, and maybe I'm not doing so satisfactorily, but that's what I've heard. Well, it's um, theoretically nice, practically not. So <laughs> I'm sure we'll solve that as well. Yeah, I'll be right here. I mean, it's interesting. It seems to me, as a non-architect, knowing nothing about architecture, that contemporary architects use the computer a lot, and most of the buildings I see are inconceivable without uh, using computers. And I would say that there's a lot of unexplored territory there, and very often they're using, from my distant perspective, they're ignoring some of the more interesting possibilities of what the computer can imagine and do. Know, Frank Gehry, for example. So, I, I, I think that there, I think that there's a lot more that that you could do uh, in architecture by looking at processes of time, for example, rather than just looking at complex kinds of shapes that you can bend a building into. Um, that's just, and I, again, I really don't know very much about it. It's only my having seen various buildings and sort of looking my, thinking to myself, okay, they made that by putting that transform on this geometry. And I, one of the reasons I was interested in coming here to talk is perhaps to suggest other ways of thinking about that. Not that this work that we're doing is architectural, but perhaps there's a way in which it might be interesting to architects. Not as a you know um, concrete way to work, but as a conceptual way to approach things. Having to do with time. Because the time of a, of a building or of a built place is equally important to its space. And I don't know, but I can be corrected, whether that's being used very much for the using of the computer. I mean, for example, there are, I know that, that people that study crowds can use some similar software, the stuff we use, to figure out how to avoid catastrophic panic situations. Um, and that's, a, that's interesting, I guess, and that's an architectural problem. People in buildings or people in spaces and how they react to each other. But I, I've always sensed that there's probably a lot more to be done in this in the area between the two fields. Yeah. I 
don't know if I understand your question, sir. Right. 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 Yeah, I mean, I th we don't do that so much. I, I know of quite a few artists, in, uh, digital artists, that, that work exactly that way. Um, the only example I could think of that's similar to that in, in what we've conceived is um, for the airport, you know, it would have reacted to external conditions, not for informational purposes, though. But we would know when it was raining outside, or we would know what time of day it was, or we would know if it was Christmas. So that information would be important to the AI at the center of this piece and, and as it orchestrated the spectacle. But it wasn't about imparting information. And one of our biggest struggles was, in that case and in others, is to prevent the pieces from becoming billboards for the display of information or advertising. And that's not something that we do. But uh, there are a lot of people that, that work in that way, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. We don't use that precise one, no, but it's what I was trying to say is that for the operations of. Um, I mean, basically what we did in Enlightenment is we took methods that you have all around you, the way an ATM works, the way AdSense works on Google, the way DNA sequencing works, which is a massive, very fast and intelligent search, and we applied it to a completely different domain, in this case, music, old music, really. So it's not that the exact same algorithms are used, although, and again, it's not my area because I didn't program it, but I think a lot of the um, underlying algorithms used in Enlightenment anyway are bioinformatic ones taken from DNA sequencing, very similar to that kind of approach. Because essentially what you're doing is you're treating, if you're looking at, at uh, DNA at genome mapping, you're saying, we know this, that there is a kind of um, structure to this piece, but we don't know what are the important units, what are the important segments, and what are the important connections, and so on and so forth. We take the exact same thing. We tell the computer, we know that this score is, you know, has structure. You figure out what it is. And it has to, it, it has to sort of bootstrap its way into understanding it. And th in that respect, it's similar. It's not that we use, actually, I wouldn't even know. But I don't think it's that we use the exact same algorithm in, in that case. But it's similar. Searching and sorting and so on. And the fact that that kind of searching and sorting be done in in uh, near real time or real time is also similar to what what you see happening all around us in the world now. So it's interesting to bring that capability to bear on art, not just commerce. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, the, the, um, when we started, we, we, I mean, uh, we were able to engage a very large audience when we started working with dance, and we were working on a much larger scale than before, and it was very gratifying. But what you quickly realize when you work in, in modern dance, and you've heard me say this many times before, is that the only people that go to see modern dance are the people that go to see modern dance. Is an extremely small audience, um, and it's somewhat similar to visual art as well. The only people who go to contemporary galleries are people who go to contemporary galleries, and there's very little accidental crossover, so on and so forth. So we've been very interested in moving out of those boundaries and making works that um, can hold their own in that in that framework, it, but they can also be engaging to people just encountering them best example of that so far was the uh, pedestrian piece, where you didn't need to know anything to be able to come to terms with it, in a sense. Uh, enlightenment was a different thing, because although it was a public artwork, 
uh, it was very much within the cultural frame of, of Lincoln Center. So we wouldn't have made it in the same way had it just been in Grand Central or something. Um, I don't know if that responds to what you're saying, but we're trying to get the work out into the world and not so much just within the narrow confines of certain strata. Um, another thing that's been interesting to us is moving away from, you know, a lot of our, our, our work is about human motion, moving away from trained movers to untrained, you know, just people. And I think that there are two extremes of beauty in motion. One is the beauty of a dancer who, whose grace comes from perfect mastery of movement, being able to hit exactly the right spot, uh, tremendous economy of, of motion and line and so on. That's on the one extreme. On the other extreme is to my eye and soul the much greater beauty of a toddler moving from one point A to point B, never repeating that way twice because she's figuring it out as she does so every single time. And what's even better about that is you can see her thinking not up here, you can see it in her, you know, in her baby toe. It's distributed throughout her body. I mean, all of our thinking is, but when you get to be uh, grown up and trained, it, it localizes and up here more. It becomes routine down here. But with a, um, a young child's movement, you have this, this beautiful thinking of the whole body. Similarly, if you look at choreography, uh, if you look at a city street uh, intersection, plaza or something, on the one hand, or if you look at playground on the other, there's an amazing richness of emergent choreography and patterning of human beings to each other that to my eye is richer than the choreography that I, that I like. So I'm, we're moving more in that direction too. So, so there are two reasons to do it. One is to engage a different kind of people or wider range of people, but also I think it's to engage a different subject. I would like it to. So far, not so much, but I'd like it to. I mean, I know Liz and Rick, um, and you've worked with them a lot. Um, I, so that interests me. And we're doing another piece I can't really describe yet because it's on the drawing board for Lincoln Center next summer, which is much more architectural, even though we're doing it ourselves as uh, would-be architects. So I think there is a strong um, potential there. Unfortunately, we haven't realized it yet because we just haven't worked with the right people, perhaps. Maybe somewhere in this room. Yeah. I wouldn't mind doing a piece in London. I like big cities. So London, or I've never been to Tokyo. I like New York a lot. Um, Beijing. Hong Kong. It's too, too vague a question, I'm not exactly sure. But I, I, the other thing that's interesting is we've had great luck with pedestrian. It's had its own legs, it's walked all over the world, and it's shown lots of different places. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to accompany it, but I have been to several places it's been. And it, even though it itself is a fixed work, it's not an AI work, it's not real time, it was made quite a while ago, five years ago, and it's fixed. <clears throat> but it changes in its meaning dramatically. We've shown it on a market square in Bruges. You know, we showed it two years ago in York on a cobblestone street leading up to the Minster. We've shown it in a, um, a, Korean, a new Korean bus station. We've shown it on the Piazza Duomo in Milan. In each place it changes, you know. But it could do so far more than that, uh, given our new capabilities, that the pieces can actually, in a sense, adapt to their surroundings. Well, 
I'll be right here. I'd be happy to talk to any of you individually, and I'm very pleased you guys uh, came out and um, look forward to hearing any of your further thoughts. Thank you.